Praise God. We're going to preach and the devil's not going to win. Amen. <laughs> Something's draining the batteries, it seems, this morning. Praise God. But no, we're so thankful that you're here today. We're so thankful to be here. I know in the first service I said, you know what, and I'm, I'm just going to have you reach over and slap your neighbor in the second service. <laughs> uh, we, might, we, might, <laughs> we might hold off. Uh, if you have your Bibles, 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy this morning, um, chapter 3. You know, it's, it's something, we're coming to the close of this year, and uh, we're getting ready to begin a new year, and uh, what we'll probably, what you'll probably hear in so many places is self-improvement, and things that you need to, in, in resolutions, and which some of these things are not necessarily bad in themselves, but uh, what about drawing close to God, and truly drawing close to God, and being the people of God that he really desires us to be, amen. Uh, we need to be those people that seek God, a people as, uh, of the presence of God. Um, we've been talking about, and again, uh, His name shall be called. Um, and and we're, we're still on the mighty God. And we'll finish the other ones at another time. But would you stand this morning for the reading of the Word of God? 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 says, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. Father, we're so thankful today. We're so thankful that we get to come into your house and that we get to... Uh, worship your name we get to exalt you we're thankful that God that we have access into the throne of grace because of what you have done for us Christ I pray that God that we would never take for granted what you've done for us and how that you have set us free how you set us free to serve you to worship you to live for you continuously and I pray that God that your spirit father would just be upon us and again, I pray, Father, for the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Jesus Christ, that we may draw closer to you, that we may come to know you in a greater way. We thank you for it all in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Well, let your neighbor know that you're glad that they're here with you today. <laughs> oh, praise God. I'm not giving you a license to abuse. <laughs> Praise God. Truly it is, uh, without controversy, a, a, a great mystery that God would reveal Himself in the way that He has revealed Himself. Our verse, uh, our foundational verse this, uh, this morning has been Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 9 in verse 6. And this is the verse that we have been talking about over these last few weeks. For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, <clears throat> the Prince of Peace. See, Christ has proved to us that he is the Mighty God. And we're going to see just a little bit of, uh, more of that confirmation this morning as he is confirmed through his word. But more than just through his word, through who he is and how he lived. The passage, as we said, uh, that we got our text from says to us that unto us a child is born. A child. Think about this. What can that do? A child. A child that is feeble, a child that totters through because <clears throat> we call them toddlers because they just kind of toddle around and, and, and they wobble here and there. And, and to think that God would come and subject himself to such humility. This is why many religions do not believe that God, that Jesus was the Christ. Because how would God humble himself in such a way to take on the form of a human much less a child, 
A child that seems helpless, that, that is taken up in his mother's arms and needs nourishment. A child that's newly born. Think about this. What child is this? A child that is going to deliver us. We, we would not even think in our own way, if we were to think of God coming in some way, we would say that He must come as a conqueror. He must come and show and reveal His power right out. But the prophet always, he continues and he says, unto us a child is born. And then he says, unto us a son is given. <clears throat> See, Christ was not only born, but He was given. Born as a human, but given as the Son of God. He comes down from on high, and He's given by God to us to become our Redeemer. And we behold His wonder. He is the mighty God. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God. And I, and I love that His name shall be. That was not a suggestion. That was a statement to you and I that His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. He says to us, and, and, and it truly is without controversy, the mystery of godliness that is seen in the way that he came. Now we look through history in the church of the church, and um, we want to see: is there enough ed evidence that we could that could substantiate the claim that Jesus is God, the child that is born, the son that is given, came into the world, and he entered in to this fallen world against all sin. See, for 30 years and upwards, he struggled and wrestled against the temptations, more numerous and, and, and more troublesome than you and I have ever known, than, than a man could ever declare. See, Adam fell when it was but a woman that tempted him. Eve fell when a serpent came unto her, but Christ, the second Adam, he stood invulnerable against all the, the spears of Satan, though he was tempted, as the Bible says, in every point like as we are. And yet, Satan did not hold anything back. He spared nothing when it came to Christ. And yet, Jesus stands as a conqueror who overcame all things. In Luke chapter 4, and if you would turn with me, I want to take just a closer look at what Jesus had overcome. In Luke chapter 4, starting with verse 1, <clears throat> immediately after his baptism, the Bible says in verse 1, And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from the Jordan. And was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being forty days tempted of the devil. And in those days he did eat nothing. And when they were ended, afterward he was hungry. Now, here Jesus is. And, and the Bible says that the Spirit of God leads him into the wilderness to be tempted. So here Jesus is being tempted of the devil for 40 days and 40 nights. A lot of times we think that he, he was only tempted with three temptations at the end of the 40 day, days and 40 nights. But the truth is, is that for 40 days and 40 nights he, undergone, he underwent temptation from every kind, of every kind. Everything that you and I will ever face, could ever face as a human being. You might say, well, pastor, we are a lot, uh, we're, we're a lot more advanced than they were these days. Um, the Bible says that, God, that Jesus Christ is antecedent. He is antecedent of time. We understand, and because our minds don't understand eternity, but Jesus, he stepped out of eternity because in, eterni in eternity, there was no such thing as past, present, future. It was all there, all the same. 
Again, our minds don't understand it. But he steps out of eternity and into time as a man and is tempted in every way that you and I could ever be tempted. And in verse 3 it picks up and says, And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone and that it be made bread. And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written, that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Now I want to continue and then we'll, 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 we'll divulge or, 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 or go back and, and, and expound. Verse 5, And the devil taking him up into a high mountain and showed him unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me to whomsoever I will give it. If thou will therefore worship me, all shall be thine. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And he brought him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, Cast thyself down from hence, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over thee, to keep thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. And Jesus answering said unto him, It is said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee. And there went out a fame of him throughout all the region round about. Now the Bible tells us that he went and he was tempted in every way that a man or a human could be tempted. But here is the temptation that is even beyond the human. See, Satan takes, to, it takes him and he says to him, he says, if you're the son of God... Then turn this, this rock into, a, into bread, this stone into bread, because he knew he was hungry. In other words, do a miracle. You see, Jesus was tempted in a way that you and I were never tempted because we are not God. We cannot do miracles. And then he takes them to, the, to this high mountain and says, I'll give you everything that your eyes see. The very thing that Jesus came to do. The very thing that he had come to accomplish. And he said, I'll give you everything because it belongs to me. See, what we don't understand is in the temptation of Adam, when Adam fell, Adam held the deed to the earth and the fullness thereof because God had given him dominion over all things. When he fell, he gave that dominion over to the devil. So the devil looks at Christ and says, I'll give it all to you. All you have to do is bow down and worship me. You see, he, he tempted him, not just as a man, but he tempted him as deity, as God. And then finally, he takes him up to the high tower and says, everything, he says, all of it is given unto me. And Jesus does not ar argue him on this point. Now we say, well, the earth and the fullness thereof belong to the Lord our God. Yes, they do. Because Jesus has sealed it and sealed it with his blood. But Satan here in the temptation, what he was doing was he was offering him a crown without a cross. Oh, so many people give in to this kind of temptation. Oh, I'll give you this and I'll give you the world and you can have everything that you want and everything that your heart desires and everything that, 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 that you desire in this life. And you don't even have to work for it. All you have to do is um, just, just give your soul to me, Satan offers. And the world tries to offer us all of these things, a, a, a crown without a cross. But see, Satan had gone, he had stood toe to toe with Satan in that wilderness, in hand-to-hand -hand combat, he, he fought against Satan on the pinnacle of the temple. In the middle of it all, Satan couldn't understand why he couldn't crush him. Because never could a man withstand the temptation that had come upon Jesus Christ. 
And yet, he conquered as an overcomer. You see, everywhere Jesus went, Satan was there to meet him as the adversary. And yet Jesus continued to establish himself as the overcomer, the conqueror, the mighty God. Every time he had the chance, he would would come against Christ to seize him. And finally, in the Garden of Gethsemane, in Luke chapter 22, we read in verse 39, And he came out and went, and he was wont to the Mount of Olives. And his disciples also followed him. And when he was at the place, he said unto them, Pray that you enter not into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose up from prayer, he was come to his disciples, and he found them sleeping for sorrow. And said unto them, Why sleep ye? Rise up and pray, lest you enter in to temptation. Let me just give you just a, 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 a nugget right here. Just a key if you will. You see Jesus has undergone temptation in every way. And without sin. And he tells his disciples on two occasions in these few verses that we've read. He says pray that you enter not into temptation. I believe that the reason why so many Christians fall to temptation and and succumb to its power is because they don't pray. Oh, we pray our little lay me down to sleep prayer or pray over our meals, but we don't really pray that we're not led into temptation. See, Satan had come to the place where he crushed him until great sweat, his, blood, his sweat was like great drops of blood. And Satan continued to press him. He wanted to crush him. He wanted to finish him. Jesus even comes to that place. If it's possible, remove this from me. But nevertheless, these words were uttered from Christ. Not as I will, but as thou will. Satan was repulsed. He hated the fact that he could not defeat him in the temptation. He hated the fact that even though he gave everything that he had, opened up his arsenal and spared nothing against Christ, it seemed as if nothing could penetrate his his being. Christ seemed to say, depart from me, get behind me. And Satan had to flee from him even for a season. See, Christ, in all of his conquests over sin, doesn't seem to to outright just declare, this is me, the great God, the mighty one. But he does. Not so much by what he says, even though he declared himself to be God. But as we've said, actions speak louder than words. He proved he was God by what he did. You see, anybody can claim to be God. But who can prove it by their actions? Anybody can say that they are are God and many have come and said that they are Christ and, and come and follow me. But none of them have been able to prove it or live it out. Only one, and that is Christ. And Christ never was, he was never overcome. He defeated. There's no creature. Satan stood back and understood and realized there was no creature that could ever endure the temptation that Jesus Christ was able to endure. No human being 
You say, well, well, what about angels? Let's look at the angels of, of heaven. How temptation em- entered there, we're not exactly sure. But the Bible says that in Satan, there was iniquity found. Because one day he stepped in front of the mirror and he looked at himself and thought, how handsome I am. And I should be the one that takes the place of the Most High. And I shall be the one that is seated there. And Satan, the deceiver, the tempter, then begins to look at the angels, those that were created along with him. And because he was the most glorious of them all, begins with his tactics and his silver tongue and begins to deceive. As the Bible says, he drew with him a third part of the stars of heaven and a third of the angels were tempted and were deceived because of the, de- of the tempter himself. Man could not withstand him. Angels could not withstand him. But there was one who stood, who was the mighty God. He was in the flesh, but he was God of gods, the everlasting God, the mighty God. And he could not be crushed by the temptations of Satan himself. The angels fell and succumbed to the temptation of Satan. We look at man, his temptation in comparison was so, so slight, so small, and yet he fell. There's not a creature that can stand against temptation. You say, I, I, I can stand. No, everyone will wield and will yield to the temptation if it's strong enough. Everyone has a breaking point. Hmm. You say, oh, I I, I would never give in to the temptation. You see, Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. One thing I've realized in this life is this. And I've talked to my wife and we've been discussing this and I've told her even as of recently, I I don't understand the only thing that I can say The only reason I am where I am and that I'm able to do the things that I do and the only reason that I can stand here before you today is because of Jesus Christ and to Him be all the glory. I was telling her, I said... I said, I, I have to give my life to God. I have to, I have to make sure that everything that I do is for the glory of God. Because everything, where I am today, every temptation that has ever come against me, everything that I've been able to overcome has only been because of Jesus Christ and what He has done for me. It has only been because of the Spirit of God directing my steps He is the one, the Bible says, His word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And He has walked me through those dark places and around the, 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 the places where Satan would have liked to trip me up. The places where Satan would have led me astray. The places where Satan, where temptation would have consumed me or overwhelmed me and crushed me. And I would have fallen. It is only because of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit in me that I have not been crushed. It's only because of Him that I'm able to stand before you today. And I'd better never, and none of us better better had never walk away from that or take that for granted. Because as soon as we do, we will be overwhelmed with the temptation of that tempter. But Christ stood. Seems to me that in His standing, He proved Himself to be the mighty God. Omnipotent. All powerful against even the greatest of temptation. Even the deceiver of the brethren. It is him whom the angels stand before with veiled faces. And they cry holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 14 says. Seeing then that we have a great high priest. Who has passed through the heavens. Jesus the son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest. Who cannot sympathize with our weakness. But was in all points. 
was in all points. Let me say that one more time. But was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You see, he was tempted in all points as we are yet without sin. And there we find the secret that we come boldly before the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You see, a lot of times people say, well, this grace thing is just, it's just a covering or an atoning for sin, but it's more than that. It is the grace of God that comes upon us, that God gives us and empowers us not to succumb to sin, but to overcome sin. You see, all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But if we're, able, if we're going to overcome sin, it is by the grace or the empowerment of the Holy Spirit in our lives. If all of this and all of these proofs still seem insufficient, then what more needed to be accomplished by Christ to prove Himself? Let's look at Galatians chapter 3. In Galatians chapter 3, starting in verse 13. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. And there is a great mystery in this, in this portion of Scripture. And, and, and as I said in first service, I will not be able to expound on it completely. But I'm going to give you a, just a nutshell, if you will. <clears throat> he says, He has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men. Though it be a man's covenant... Yet if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth thereto. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He says, he says not, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. So God makes us a covenant he makes a covenant to Abraham in this passage. And that covenant was, as we're going to see, it was 430 years before the law ever came in to, in, in, in to, onto the scene. Some say, well, what do you mean that God revealed Christ unto Abraham? Abraham understood clearly what God's plan was for you and me. We didn't understand it, but God revealed it very well to Abraham. So much so that the Bible says that Abraham was looking for a city whose builder and maker was God. Meaning he wasn't looking for something of dirt. He was looking for that city that's 1,500 miles high, 1,500 miles wide, and 1,500 miles long. He was looking for that gold city where the streets are paved with gold. Oh, we don't believe in fairy tales, Pastor. Well, you just keep thinking that because it isn't a fairy tale. That's, as, that's more real than the, than the chair that you're sitting on this morning. He goes on to say in verse 17, And this I say that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. For if the inheritance of, be of the law, it is no more of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. So here's what the Bible is saying to you and me. We don't understand, we didn't understand exactly what it means to, to cut a covenant 
um, and, and to make a covenant unto God, but Abraham did. And the Bible says, and God told him, gave him the instructions, you take this beast and that beast, and he cut them in half, and he put the halves on each side of a trough, and he had to dig out a trough. And you have to kind of get the picture that as these halves are laying on each side, Abraham is cutting a covenant with God and the blood is draining into this, into the bottom of this and he's treading through the blood of these animals and he's making a covenant with God. Well, in the process, Satan, the, the birds that are coming down are trying to take the, 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 the sacrifice away and, say, and, and Abraham is fighting off these birds and he fights them off all the day long until finally in complete exhaustion and he collapses on the side of the trough. 430 years before the law came into effect. 430 years before people were brought into bondage by the law. 430 years, the, the covenant of grace was made unto Abraham and Abraham understood it well. When Abraham finally comes to in a vision, he sees, he sees two standing between the halves and they're cutting a covenant with one another. See, it's not that Abraham cut the covenant with God, but the son and the father were cutting the covenant. They were finishing the covenant, walking between the halves, in between the, in, in between the blood. What it represented was all of these years later, that covenant, all of this was just foretelling. Uh, there was going to be a cross on the mountain of Gethsemane where Jesus, well, on the mountain of Golgotha, where, where Jesus himself would be crucified and he would seal the covenant once and for all by his own blood. But this was the same covenant. And so God is giving us the promise that was Abraham's unto us because it says unto his seed, not seeds, not you and me. It would only come through Jesus Christ because Abraham understood and he knew Jesus Christ all of these years before so we know also that Christ proved himself even in this to be the mighty God the promise was greater than the greater than the law and that promise was was it stood because of the blood of Jesus Christ all the sins of all the people were gathered upon his shoulders and just as we, we see all that he had taken upon himself, the Bible says he bare them all on his own body on a tree. All of the sins of the world, even as the blood drained into that trough, all of the sins of the world came upon Jesus Christ. And he became a curse for you and for me. He that knew no sin became a curse for you and me. And he... As the wrath of God came against that sin, wave after wave, he stood and he withstood and he stood overcoming all of this because he alone was God. Man, weakened by the flesh, could not do it. But with many signs of human weakness, Christ... And convincing signs of his omnipotence. The Bible says he took all our griefs. And he carried all our sorrows. See the divinity. He's, with his divinity he strengthened his manhood. And he lifted up his head. And he withstood all so that you and I could be free. As a conqueror. He put the sins of his people to public execution. In Colossians chapter 2 and verse 15, the Bible says, And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. On the cross, he once and for all spoiled powers and principalities, made a show of them openly, Destroying the power of sin. Destroying those that would bring it upon us. Destroying the tempter himself. Even in the cross. The only one that could do this. Is God himself. He is the mighty God. But the truth is. Is he did even more than this. 
You see, we don't understand the fullness of what Jesus and the extent to what Jesus had to go through for you and me. You see, because if it was us on that cross, then we would have had to go to to that grave and we would have had to suffer the hell that was awaiting us because there was no sacrifice for sin. But he did this for us. He descended into the grave and there he slept, fettered with the cold chains of death. In Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4 verse 7 it says, But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore, he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Verse 9, now that he ascended... What is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fulfill all things. In other words, when Christ was laid in that grave, you see, Jesus tells the story of the rich man and Lazarus and after they both die, they're, they, they're, the, the Lazarus is in the bosom of Abraham. He's not in heaven yet, but he's in a holding place. And the rich man that went to hell, he could see him from the other side of this gulf that, that could not be uh, connected. And so he says, please tell him to, to tell my brothers or, or let me go back and tell my brothers Not to come here to to live their lives for you. Jesus said, even if one comes back from the dead, they would not hear you. He proved that. But they were being held there because the ultimate sacrifice, the blood of Jesus Christ, had not been shed on the cross yet. So Jesus, when he went and they laid him in that tomb, he went down into the pits of hell. He took the keys from Satan himself and he took and he led all of those who were being held captive there and he led captivity captive in other words he bound the one that kept them bound you see we don't always understand the power of the, and the strength of the gospel when God speaks to us but Jesus Christ went into the pits of hell and then he led those and he set them free The sunlight on the third day began to to glisten. And all of a sudden, the bands that held him there were broken as if there was nothing there. And the Lord of life and the Lord of glory arose. And corruption, his body did not see because they were not able to hold him. And death had no hold. And he says, death, where is your sting? You see, he could, death could not hold him. The plague of the grave could not keep, keep him. And he, had, he of all, he destroyed the destroyer. As I said, we don't understand the power of the mighty God. When the Bible talks about he destroys the destroyer. He swallows the swallower. Satan is seen as... This, 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 this swallower of worlds. We see this maybe in Marvel movies. How they swallow, he, he swallows worlds and all the people are afraid of him because if he ever gets a hold of them, um, there will be nothing left. In other words, he, he just leaves death and destruction in his path. Well, the Bible talks about God swallowing the swallower. As if Satan had any power over him. As if death had the right to hold and to keep Satan. It was finally the one person that death was was overcome. And death was beaten by because it could not hold him. It could not keep him. And so he destroyed the destroyer. As I said in first service, it may not be, it may, it may not be necessarily uh, the, the most biblical or theological correct 
Uh, but if you remember the Hulk, when he, when he takes uh, Loki and he gives him a few slams, and then he says this little line, puny God. What Christ had proven by not being able to hold, be, be held in the grave was he looked at Satan and said, you are a puny, you are a little G God. You are nothing. See, a lot of times people, the, the Bible says that they were all, all their lives afraid to die. Why? Because they were afraid of Satan himself. They were afraid of death. They were afraid of the unknown. And Jesus took that and he completely destroyed it. Who is immortal but Christ? He is the self-existent one. He is the immortal one. He is the one that overcomes hell. He is the one that overcomes death in the grave. He is eternal. He is the beginning. He is without end. There are no shackles that can hold him. He is the mighty God. He is the one who leads the captive, captivity captive. He is the one who crushes death. Him and only him. He is king of kings and lord of lords. And there is none like him. He has proved himself to be the mighty God. Our soul declares this. What would be of us if Christ had not come? What would be of us if Christ had not come? He proves himself to us again and again. A mighty God. He forgives us of our sins. I've often thought, thank God he's God and I'm not. Amen. Because as I said, if I was God, I'd be tired of me. How many times would you have given up on you? But he being God, he's the one that sustains us and he keeps us. And the Bible says he upholds us with his mighty right hand. There's none like him. You see, we, we experience that love, that forgiveness, that grace, that mercy that relieves our conscience because He forgives our sins. He sets us free from the guilt and the grief that, that would swallow us and consume us. He sets us free from the power of temptation even. If we will but hold to Him and trust Him, seek Him, He will deliver us. Things that were impossible for us to accomplish at one point, He has imparted to us by His Holy Spirit that is in us. It's His grace, it's His fullness that He's promised unto us. And He's given it to us freely. We have experienced the power of the mighty God. Our soul declares what He's done for us. And what He's done for us could never have been done by a mere man. Only by the mighty God. Oh, if we could, if we could but see for a moment where we would be without Him. There would be no gratitude that we could offer Him that would satisfy the longing of our soul. He's washed our sins. He's made us whole. He must be God. Because none could do it but God. What could we do for ourselves? But yet He patiently bears with us. He blesses us with overflowing blessings. He forgives us freely. He enriches our lives. He must be God. And then He crowns us with righteousness. He is the mighty God. Would you stand? You see, the Bible teaches us and tells us, in light of all that we know, 
in light of who he is and what he's done for you. And when we think of where we would be without him, eternally lost. And even that thought cannot even be appreciated by our finite minds. Eternally lost without him. And yet, he frees us. He forgives us so freely. He restores our soul, even as the psalmist says. He delivers us constantly from the troubles that would befall us. I can tell you this, I don't know how many times he's delivered me. I couldn't tell you. There's so many times that I would have been consumed had it not been for for his presence, for his mercy and his grace in my life. I would have been taken out so many times if it had not been for His covering and His and His protection over my life. I didn't deserve it, but He loved me. The infinite covered me with His wings when Satan would have loved to destroy me. He led me in paths of righteousness You know what? For his name's sake. Not merely for me, but because he loved me. He feeds me with the wealth and the riches of heaven. He delivers me, takes away my grief. He is the mighty God. In spite of your sins and your backslidings, In spite of all of those things that we have done against Him. His blood still prevails. He still loves you. He still desires to forgive you. Come as you will. And offer your body as as, uh, Paul said. As a living sacrifice. Holy and acceptable unto Him. Which is the least that you and I can do in light of everything that He has done for us. What a mighty God He is. Praise God. I wouldn't allow this year to close without giving anyone and everyone the opportunity to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. You see, against the enemy, you're defenseless. You have no hope. There's no hope of winning. There's no hope of overcoming. uh, Apart from Jesus Christ. And yet he so freely gave himself for you and for me. Now one of the things that confuse so many is. People say well. I know Jesus Christ. I would argue the fact. No you might know about Jesus Christ. But you don't really know him. What do you mean, Pastor? Um, You see, we we equate knowing or having information on Jesus Christ as knowing Him personally. Truth is, is as I've said before, you could know me. You could know where I was born. You could know where I lived. You could know what schools I've gone to. You know my parents. um, You could know all there is to know about me. But until you sit down and have a conversation with me over and over, You don't know me. So many people, they have a lot of information on Jesus Christ. They can even quote Bible verses and and make you, and maybe even impress you in the flesh. But they don't know Jesus. If that's you today, I want to give you an opportunity to begin a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's only the beginning. But from there, um, it'll be a lifelong relationship with Him where He will enrich your life every single moment. And if that's you, I want to pray with you. The Bible says we believe in our heart. We confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus Christ. He's faithful and just, forgives us of all of our sins. And we get a brand new start with Him. And it's just the beginning. And then we start this 
wonderful journey through life and through eternity with him. If that's you today and you want to know Jesus Christ, whether you're in here or watching online, I want you to pray this prayer with me. Amen. As we pray today, Father, forgive me because I am a sinner. Jesus, you did what no man could do. Only you. You gave your body as a living sacrifice, broken open and poured out for me. Forgive me of all my sins. Jesus, be my Savior, my Lord, and my God. Holy Spirit, come into my life. Empower me that I may live my life in a way that honors and pleases the Father. I ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we're so thankful, God. We're so thankful, God, in this moment. We're so thankful. We're so thankful, God, because of what you've done for us, God. There is nothing, nothing, absolutely nothing we could do to repay you. But you're, you're not looking for repayment. You gave it freely. I pray that God, that the least that we could do, Father, is give ourselves totally and completely to you. Body, soul, mind, spirit. Every part, every, every part of our being, God. I pray that, God, that as we move forward in this new year, we would be fully and totally surrendered to you. What I want to do in these next few moments is I want to open up these altars because we're going to close out the new year in, in, a right, in the right way. I want to do that right here in these altars as we get ready and prepare for the festivities later on in the day. And I know that there's a lot that we we might have to do, but I can tell you this, this is the most important moment that we're going to have this this today is, is to get alone with Him. And so what I want to do is I just want to open up these altars that in this new year, this is, this is, this is the heart of your pastor also, is I've come a long way, but I can tell you this, I've got a long way to go. God has done a lot in my life up to this point, but I can tell you like Paul, I am by no means perfect yet but I press on towards the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus there's so much more yet to explore so much more yet to receive from God so much more that he has for us and so much more that he wants to do in us and through us and he wants to use us in great and awesome ways every moment every day of our lives wherever we are so can we just in these next few moments what I want to do is I want to open up these altars and just let it be a time where where we come to come close to God and we just we just give him everything just offer him all of it and, and just begin to ask him God strengthen me this year to live for you strengthen me that that God that I may truly honor and please you in everything I do and everything I say in every aspect of my life help me to be holy as you are holy can we do that this morning? And then if you have a need or something, we'll be there and we'll, we would love to pray with you over those needs, whatever the, it might be that you're facing, whatever it is that you're going through. But hear me, we serve the mighty God, the one true God. So as we begin this morning in worship, I want you just to come and, and, and fill these altars and just give that to God. Wrap this year up, give it to God, give Him thanks for all that He's done. And give him thanks for all that he is going to do in the days and the year ahead. Father, we thank you today. We thank you, Holy Spirit. We thank you, God, that we get to come into your presence because of the blood that was shed for us. We thank you for the sacrifice that was made that no man could make. 
it was only because of you, Jesus. Jesus, I thank you for for taking my sin upon you, past, present, future, and paying for my sin and becoming the curse so that I wouldn't have to. And in turn, you gave, you, by your word, said that you gave me righteousness, that now I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Jesus, you took the things that you you shouldn't have, but you did it anyways because no man could do it. It had to be God. And I want to say thank you, God, in this in this year, you've delivered us in more ways than we could even recall. And yet we stand here, God, powerless, but only, Father, by your Holy Spirit that is in us, able to overcome. Every test, every trial, everything that the enemy would bring against us because of your Holy Spirit and power that resides in us, Help us this, this morning, God, as we remember those things, God, to continue to commit ourselves to you, God. Thank you for the promise that you made in Jesus' name. Father, we're so thankful. We're so thankful, God, for your presence. We're so thankful, Jesus, for being the mighty God and doing whatever it took to set us free. Not just for the eternal life that we're going to enjoy with you, but God, so that we could even in this life overcome pain, troubles, temptation, sorrow, grief. Jesus, Without you, we would truly be lost. I'm so indebted. But God, even as we know, Father, you're not looking for us to pay you back. You're just wanting us to worship you in spirit and in truth. To love you with all of our heart, body, soul, and mind. God, may we just offer all that we are to you, God. May we give ourselves to the eternal purpose and that God, that your will would truly be our will. That nevertheless, God, whatever may come, your will be my will. Your will be done in my life. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would continue to uphold me by your strength, by your mind, by your power. Father, I pray that you would uphold us by your mighty right hand as you have so graciously done. Thank you for not giving up on me. And I pray that God, that in your hand, Father, I may stand under the power of your Holy Spirit and finish the work that you've called me to do. Each one of us, God, that, Father, with greater purpose, with greater urgency, let it be truly, Father, a fire that shut up in our bones, that, God, that we cannot hold it in. We cannot keep it in. But, God, let the power of your Spirit in us, Father, be seen through us. Set us aflame, O oh God, our God, the consuming fire. The swallower of the swallower, God. The King of kings and the Lord of lords. The mighty one. The great I am. The lily of the valley. The lion of the tribe of Judah. Oh God, the one that there is no other. The rock of our salvation. Oh God, in Jesus' mighty, mighty name. Let your spirit arise in us, oh God, your people. Let us see, Father, what is ahead for us. Equip us for the battle. 
Help us to stand on our feet, O God, under the power of your anointing, God, as we move forward, God, into a lost world, in a dark world, and shine a light so bright that darkness cannot comprehend it, but it overwhelms the darkness, O God. O God, in Jesus' mighty name, commission us again. Call us by your Spirit today. And lead us, God, into this new year, Father, into this new chapter of our lives. God, with greater, with greater joy, Father, with greater zeal for you, God. With a greater dependence upon you, God. Knowing, Father, that everything that we are and all that we'll ever be is because of Jesus Christ today. Oh, we give you all the glory. 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 We give you all the glory today. We give you all the glory. And one day, and one day, Jesus, one day, we'll cast our crowns at your feet. To you and you alone are worthy of all the praise. In Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. 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 To you be all the glory, all the praise, and all the honor. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. And amen. And amen. Praise God. He's worthy. Amen. He's worthy.